um, Facebook Live program with, with the idea here being that one of the things that we've talked about in the Wesleyan Bible Church, some of us have talked together about the idea of discipling disciples. I did talk to someone on the phone a little over a week ago about uh, what we do, and this was one of the things that was mentioned of what we do to help people to be discipled. In other words, there are some organizations that do a lot to see people brought to a point where they say that they are saved, born again, made right with Jesus, have their sins forgiven, and yet those same people still need to be taught, still need to be discipled, so we've made that a goal of ours here to do our best, uh, even with our limited talents. So one of the first things that we decided we would do was to use some uh, some information and some curriculum that we used or that we heard the used this summer that's been written by uh, Nathan Brown and uh, he he has a website all of this is available on it I'm not going to go into where it is right at the moment because it's something we'll talk about in depth later on but the point is uh, that this is at least what where we're beginning is um, material that he's written and we want to give him credit for it and also say that uh, he gives anyone that wants to use it permission to use it. So here we go. We want to begin with these words from Matthew chapter 28, 18 to 20. Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. That's what we're going to be breaking down. What does it mean, then, if we're going to be discipling all nations? What exactly does it mean? to be a disciple of Jesus. And it begins with being a disciple of Jesus means being committed to him alone, committed to him first. Uh, Jesus faithfully preached the gospel of the kingdom of God and he eagerly welcomed all who believed. So the question is, what does it mean to be a disciple of Jesus? means being committed to him alone. And Jesus um, welcomed all who believed. However, when large crowds began to follow the, him, he turned to them and urged them to consider or to think about what they're doing. And probably that's something that would be imperative today, is when people say that they are following Jesus, they're Christians, a lot of people call themselves Christians, but part of discipleship would be reminding them uh, that there's actually more to this than just calling yourself by the name of a Christian. Um, oh, and by the way, those of you who are here, the two of you, um, this is more like Sunday school in a sense. Yeah, there's three. More like Sunday school in a sense uh, that... We discussion is fine. Stop me, ask me questions, whatever you need to do. And then those of you who are following on Facebook Live, um, if you put your questions up, they will be uh, they will be translated to transmitted, translated. What's the word I'm trying to say to me? And we'll talk about them. So you, if if you're watching online and you want to ask a question, go ahead, put it, uh, type it in, and and you can we'll get to it. All right. So, Jesus turned to those large crowds that were following him and urged them to consider what they were doing. Uh, Mark 8, 34, 35 says this, And calling the crowd to him with his disciples, he said to them, If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. 
So, so that's three things, right? Deny yourself, take up your cross, follow Jesus. For whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospels will save it. And, and we saw that mentioned in that little video clip this morning uh, where Richard Wormbrand and his wife were talking about getting out from behind what we used to call the Iron Curtain all those years ago. And uh, they, his wife used this verse to challenge him to stay and do the work that they did. Luke 14, 25 through 27, and then verse 33 says this. Now great crowds accompanied him, that's Jesus, and he turned and said to them, if anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, yes, and even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Whosoever does not bear his own cross, there it is again, and come after me, cannot be my disciple. So therefore, any one of you who does not renounce all that he has cannot be my disciple. Now, there's this word about hating. And uh, as we study Scripture, we, one of the things to remember is that Scripture never contradicts itself. So when you read something that seems to be contradictory, and this isn't just Scripture, this is any time you're reading anything, that, that you put it in context. And so... This word hate is very strong, and, and the way you can, can uh, reconcile this, what Jesus is saying here is with Scripture, is what he was really saying was, we're, we're to love our parents, we're to love our mother, father, and our siblings, and our wives, and our kids, but in comparison, the love that we're to have for God, in comparison to that, that earthly love, um, it's it's so much higher that the difference between hating somebody and loving somebody with an earthly love, those are actually closer uh, to each other than what this love for God, this heavenly love, is to earthly love. <clears throat> so this shows us that being Jesus' disciple is different from being someone else's disciple. Being a disciple of Jesus involves a commitment. Commitment can be a word in, in our day that um, can be used very lightly. In, in a day when, you know, we used to think of marriage as a lifelong commitment. And now it's barely more than, it's not a lot different to get divorced than it is to br break up with your girlfriend like you did in fifth grade or whatever. So... <laughs> Commitment can be taken lightly. That's why this, the importance of what we just read, I mean, the, the strength of the words are so important in what we just read. Because when Jesus talked about hating father and mother, he meant that we must love, love God more than we love anyone else. And our loyalty to Jesus must come before loyalty to our country, to our church, to our family, to our spouse, to our children, are we willing to love God more than anyone or anything else? That's the commitment that is meant when we're talking about being a disciple of Jesus. It means a commitment. It means a cross. Now, the cross was an instrument of humiliation and death, and if we want to follow Jesus... We have to die to ourselves. Now, that's language that we heard um, used, and to some people that that gives connotations of things that they find uncomfortable. But we need to sometimes step away from what some of these things we've heard in our history and uh, what we associate with that, and just realize that really what we have to do is be dead to our own plans dead to our own wishes, dead to what I want to do, what I think my life should look like, all of those things, dead to what other people think about me, dead to what I think about me, and just sold out 
to fill the place that God has for us, and sometimes that, uh, that can feel like a cross, but we have renounced the right to control our own fate and choose our own way. That's what it means to be a disciple or a follower of Jesus. Are we willing to give up being our own master and obey the will of Christ? <clears throat> when Nathan Brown was teaching this, when we heard it this summer, he talked about the fact that he preferred the defining himself as a Christ follower rather than just being a Christian. Now, part of that just has to do with connotation, once again, of words in our language and in our society and in our culture. He's being specific about saying, not, I'm not just a follower of Jesus in name only, identifying with a certain church by saying I'm a Christian, but rather I'm saying literally I am a follower of Christ or a disciple of Christ because those words really mean the same thing uh, to the point where uh, I have made that commitment and I have taken up my cross. And, and then it goes on to say that there's a cost because Jesus warned those who didn't consider the true cost of their endeavors would th find themselves unable to complete them and in Luke chapter 2, he says in verse 28, I'm sorry, Luke chapter 14, For which of you desiring to build a tower does not first sit down and count the cost, whether he has enough to complete it? Verse 29, Otherwise, when he has laid a foundation and is not able to finish it, all who see it begin to mock him, saying, This man <clears throat> began to build a tower and was not able to finish Verse 31, or what king going out to encounter another king in war will not sit down first and deliberate whether he is able with 10,000 to meet uh, him who comes against him with 20,000. And if not, while the other is yet a great way off, he sends a delegation and asks for terms of peace. There is a cost. And, and that old song that we used to hear sung At altar calls, have you counted the cost? And, and you, it is up to us to weigh. Have we counted the cost of what it means to be a follower of Jesus? And we weigh it against, have we counted the cost of not following Jesus? But one thing's for sure, we can't go into it saying, I'm a follower of Jesus, I'm a disciple of Christ, I'm following him, I'm committed to him without counting the cost and saying I'm willing to pay whatever it costs to be right with God. Being a disciple of Jesus means following him. The word disciple in, in the Greek means learner or pupil or follower. And throughout the Gospels and the book of Acts, it refers to those who followed after a rabbi or a teacher. Being a disciple means entering into a relationship with the one you are following. So once again, you commit to follow them, learn from them, and obey them. And when we're saved, we enter into a master-disciple relationship with Jesus. He's the master, he's the teacher, we're the disciple, or we're the follower. Baptism is our first act of obedience. That's the pattern now. We, we weren't taught that well sometimes. <laughs> but that's the pattern that you find in the Gospels. That when somebody truly committed and said, okay, I am now a follower of Jesus. Now, up to this point in our society, that hasn't had a great impact a lot of times on people's lives to say that they're a Christian. But in that time, as Christianity was growing, uh, and spreading, it was often met with opposition. It was met with opposition because the people who were Jews, um, their religion was being challenged. In other words, they had built 
by the time that Jesus came on the scene, uh, Judaism had been built around a whole series of traditions. And, and it was the traditions that were taught and, and uh, they were taught by the, the, the teachers who were part of the leaders, the, um, the leaders of, or the religious leaders, the Pharisees and the Sadducees. And it all centered around actually being followers of those men because they were the ones who taught you what the law and the traditions were and told you how they were to be followed, which was to their advantage because they were able to make up loopholes for themselves to be able to do the things that they did. Um, so, so whenever people went to become followers of Jesus, they actually were rejecting that system. That's why there's, there's a whole... Uh, letter that's a book in the New Testament that's written to the Hebrews. And it teaches, it's meant to teach Christians who, who were coming from Judaism how, how that Jesus and all that he did was tied to what they actually had been taught. But they had to change their way of thinking. They were thinking and they were rejecting the traditional teachings of their day. And, and then on the other hand, you had people who were becoming Christians on the Gentile side who were coming from, um, they were coming from idol worship and those types of things. And this idea that you were going to follow a teacher that was going to teach you to reject, because really what their philosophies were centered around generally was satisfying yourself satisfying your own desires and and when you became a christian you were rejecting those teachings and so you weren't doing anything popular and the first sign that that was given by you to the people who were looking on was baptism so it really did matter um being uh so <clears throat> Sorry, I'm trying to find my way in my notes again here. But you began um, by giving a public, a public testimony by your baptism. It was your first act of obedience. It was a public testimony that you had be, decided to become a follower of Christ. And the same is true today. Some people get baptized because it's their tradition. But that's by no means what it was meant to be. And even today, when we do become a follower of Jesus and we do make that commitment, we should be baptized. Um, our calling as Jesus' disciple is to follow him, to learn from him, and to obey him. The master-disciple relationship sounds a little bit strange today. So, so now we're... we're kind of transitioning or at least beginning to look at this not just as me as a follower of Jesus and committed to Jesus and um, taking up my cross and following Jesus and paying the cost to follow Jesus but part of the instruction that we receive as Christians is that as we follow Jesus and we're a disciple of Jesus we're to disciple others and so it's, it's easy for us to say, okay, master-servant is the relationship between us and Jesus, but it gets a little bit strange when we, when we take that viewpoint, especially in the context of our modern day. So it might be easier to look at that as like a coach and player relationship, um, where while we're following Jesus and we're in community with other people, um, we're coaching and we're teaching and we're helping people to follow as we follow uh, when you join a sports team you become a disciple of your coach you place yourself under his authority and agree to do whatever he tells you your goal is to learn to think about the game like your coach and you're subject to his correction and discipline and you work hard to earn his praise and respect Being a disciple of Jesus means imitating him and those who follow his example. 
so there it is. While the word disciple is used in the gospel and Acts, the word imitator, it's, it's a different word in the Greek, is used throughout the rest of the New Testament. So, so disciple is used up through the book of Acts, but then as you go on, the word changes to imitator because who, who, who are we reading about as we read the Gospels? It is what about Jesus' ministry. It's about him and his ministry on this earth. And we're to be disciples of him, but then in the book of Acts is that transition from people directly following Jesus on this earth to the church following the promptings of the Holy Spirit and the, the ministry of apostles and teachers and preachers coming alive through the ministry of the Holy Spirit and teaching those who are a part of the New Testament church to be imitators of Christ, but also, to Paul said it, watch me. Be an imitator of me as I imitate Christ. And so that word changes from being disciples to imitators. And this word does a great job of expressing the heart of what it means to be a disciple of Jesus, being like him. Therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children is what the Apostle Paul wrote to the church at Ephesus. Children naturally imitate their parents. A little bit scary to think about. But children naturally imitate their parents in the same way we're to imitate God. And, and it's in uh, the first letter that the Apostle Paul wrote to the church at Corinth. In the 11th chapter, he said, Be imitators of me as I am of Christ. We are called not only to imitate Christ, but also to imitate those who faithfully follow Christ. Brothers, join in imitating me and keep your eyes on those who walk according to the example you have in us, the Apostle Paul says again. Lest we think that only apostles qualify to be imitated, Paul calls, uh, calls us to imitate all who walk according to his godly example. The, the, and, and we could talk probably all night about what it means to be an apostle, but the point is this here is um, it doesn't necessarily mean that we only imitate apostles, but within our circle of believers, our community, uh, there are those who have followed Jesus. I don't know it, if you remember when Dr. Avery was here, he talked about how he had, I think it was a young lady that came into his office that was a student that said, I don't even know what it looks like to be a Christian. And, and he told her, watch me. And, and, and you could tell right away, he, he must have seen, maybe Dr. Avery saw somebody that was sitting in front of him, kind of struck by that, because he went on to explain that that might sound strange, he said, but, he, and he began to talk about if he wanted to build something, he could talk to somebody who'd been building for almost 30 years or how to teach somebody who'd been teaching for almost 30 years or how to be involved in politics or whatever it may be, you know. Uh, be a mom. <laughs> um, it, it's, it's okay to say, I've been, I've been walking with Jesus a long time and you're new at this. And even though I may not be perfect, watch me. And as I imitate what you read in Scripture, then imitate me. It's okay. That. Right? Yes. Yes. Um, yeah, that's 1 Corinthians 11. 1. But um, also... In Philippians 3.17, the Apostle Paul wrote, Brothers, join in imitating me and keep your eyes on those who walk according to the example you have in us. Now, we're, oh, we're going to struggle. 
<laughs> I think because this is, this is the NIV stuff. And so, so you're thinking like I would in King James. Yeah, so it's, it's most likely the same verse. Um, he also goes on in 2 Thessalonians, For you yourselves know how you ought to imitate us, because we were not idle when we were with you, nor did we eat anyone's bread without paying for it. But with toil and labor we worked night and day, that we might not be a burden to any of you. It was not because we do not have that right, but to give you and ourselves an example to imitate. And this is a specific, specific example of how Paul limited his liberty in order to set an example for the church at Thessalonica. And this illustrates what kind of behavior we should imitate as well as what kind of example we need to be for other people. Yes. Right. And the unfortunate thing is that too, too often people have sat in church and said, well, that's not me, so don't look at me. But then who can people see that you rub shoulders with, as you said, as, that you rub shoulders with if you're not the example? If you say, I'm not capable, or I'm not willing, or I'm not sold out, then who will be their example? And so you can't, you can't, it's not something that we can opt out of. You know what kind of men we proved to be among you for your sake, and you became imitators of us and of the Lord, for you received the word in much affliction with the joy of the Holy Spirit, so that you became an example to all the believers in Macedonia and in Achaia. And, and once again, that's written to the church of Thessalonica, but that's exactly what we're talking about. If those believers who had received uh, the gift of the gospel and been filled with the Holy Spirit, if they hadn't been an example, who would have influenced people in Macedonia and Achaia? They're far, far from Jerusalem. And yet, that's how the church grew. And, and I guess that is really the, the thought behind when I've talked to certain people about discipling disciples. You know, people say, well, I have a plan for church growth. Well, so do I. You, you can try to add people or you can multiply. And multiplication is much more effective when we have people within our community of believers who are so who are so who so understand the concept, men and women, who so understand the concept of being a follower of Christ and its relation to being imitators of Christ so that people looking on understand what it means and who Jesus is, and they are drawn to be imitators of Christ. And so some churches have had talented um, singers or preachers or whatever, and, and people will come to hear them. But really the way it should work is that I, as the pastor, uh, I have a responsibility to teach and to preach truth and the gospel, but those who take it in also have a responsibility to take it with them, with you, and deliver it to other people. <clears throat> In the book of Hebrews, chapter 6, verse 12, we read, And we desire each one of you to show the same earnestness, to have the full assurance of hope until the end, so that you may not be sluggish, but imitators of those who through faith and patience inherit the promises. The Bible is filled with people whose faith and righteousness stands as an example to us today. And then once again in the book of Hebrews, remember your leaders those who spoke to you the word of God, consider the outcome of their way of life and imitate their faith. First, consider the outcome of their way of life. It's amazing to me that sometimes it just takes time for, for the truth to come to the top 
and, and people who aren't really imitators of Christ to fall away. And many, many times, and we're surprised. You mean that really that one actually really fell away? How could it be? And yet we can we can watch and after we've watched and we've observed and we consider the outcome of their way of life, we can imitate their faith. Our spiritual leaders should be obeyed and imitated for they watch over our souls. Being a disciple of Jesus means coaching others in how to follow him. And, and as, when I'm finished, I have a chart that's going to kind of tie all of this together that I'm going to share with you. Um, but let's keep working our way through this. Being a disciple of Jesus means coaching others in how to follow him. First of all, invest. Now, um, investing works best when it's long term number one number two investing generally makes means making a sacrifice so it means doing things that are hard and it also means choosing to leave some things aside and that's not just about following jesus but this is investing in other people's lives all too often disciple making has been understood as merely preaching the gospel on Sunday, leading the lost to Christ. I don't even know how well we practice that. <laughs> I mean, I, in my years, I've, I've seen some people try to lead some classes on soul winning, that type of thing. I, I've often used the uh, illustration that's personal, happened to me, um, there was, there was a guy, so, so we used to work on these big tracked home sites, and there were a lot of guys, and we were all subcontractors, but we got to know each other. And we'd, we'd take, uh, I was working with my dad, we'd take our radio, and uh, we'd listen to certain programs. We didn't listen to the radio all day long, but we would listen to certain programs, and... Uh, one of the things that we would listen to was Paul Harvey and the rest of the story. And this guy came along, and he was a very vocal Christian, okay? So everybody knew, and he was loud about it. He was also slightly obnoxious. And uh, we were listening to the rest of the story. It was late in the day, and this guy came along, and he laid on the driveway. And I don't even remember what the story was, but I, I think it had some spiritual emphasis that time. But he laid on the driveway, and he listened to it, and when he jumped up, or at the, when it ended, he jumped up and he shouted, praise the Lord or hallelujah or something like that. And uh, there was another guy that we worked with that basically that, that particular man was so obnoxious in his approach that this guy who was basically maybe a nominal Christian, he had asked him, well, do you know Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior? He was so turned off by that guy. And, and just his weirdness, that he wanted nothing to do with it. So um, there, there's that thing of where you try to push it. You're, you're trying to make a point. And the point is, I'm a great Christian. And if you have to make that point, you're probably not going to be an effective witness. <laughs> That's right. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah that's right they do <laughs> that's right oh okay okay got it so the point is that that yeah that people view that as you being pushing your religion on them right and and it's a turnoff because it's practiced, I, th I think. And, and not only that, this guy really um, didn't have a good example to put out in front of people anyhow. 
And, and so when, when you really take, so we're talking about investing probably for too long. Um, and leading the lost to Christ or making a compelling case for faith, it has to be real. People have to realize you're not just there trying to promote your religion so you can add numbers to your role. But you, you, as we talked about this morning, you have compassion, you care, and you're investing into their life because there's something that you have that they need. <clears throat> so invest. Being a disciple of Jesus means coaching others in how to follow him. So invest. Explain. Jesus said, make disciples, teaching them to observe all I have commanded unto you. <clears throat> all I have commanded you, I'm sorry. People won't know how to follow Christ if we don't teach them. That, that sounds so very simple, and yet it's so profound. that It's amazing to me that people have made strides to come to church, and they're interested in following Jesus, and we go, great, let's just watch them. Hopefully they'll figure it out. Instead of investing them in them enough to teach them. Because if we don't teach them, who will? Oh, the Holy Spirit will. Well, you remember what we read in, in 2 Corinthians chapter 5? That God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself and has given to us the ministry of reconciliation. It's, we can't say it's up to God because he's... He's enlisted us to be a part of his ministry of reconciling the whole world to himself. And so we have to explain. People won't know how to follow Christ if we don't teach them. Paul left an example of obedience to this commandment. When he was in Corinth, he stayed a year and six months teaching the word of God among them. And we can go to 2 Timothy 1.13 where it says, follow the pattern of the sound words that you have heard from me in the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. We must teach others how to be disciples. We invest, we explain, and we show. Sound teaching is essential to discipleship, but our personal example is the foundation. It's the foundation on which disciple-making is built. And so as we invest in people, they learn what it means to invest in other people. As we teach, they learn what it looks like to teach others. As we show them, they'll show others. And then exhort. You know, there comes a time when, when with confidence, because of what we've invested and what we've taught, we can actually exhort. And we can go to people and uh, Paul, Paul told the Corinthians, be imitators of me as I am of Christ. And once we've taught others how to follow Christ and showed them by example, we must urge them to take action and live it themselves. Once they put into practice what they've learned, we can encourage them and help them to grow. Being a disciple of Jesus means persuading others to follow him. Being a disciple of Jesus means persuading others to follow him. And we can look to Scripture uh, John 1, 43 through 46, the next day Jesus decided to go to Galilee. He found Philip and said to him, follow me. Now Philip was from Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter. Philip found Nathanael and said to him, we have found him of whom Moses in the law and also the prophets wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Nathanael said to him, can anything come good come out of Nazareth? And Philip said to him, come and see. And, and that's, that's a great text, but I won't take a text and start preaching all over again. But there's a picture there of Jesus was seen, yeah, and, and he called Philip. And Philip then went and told Nathaniel and, and said to him, this is the guy. And, and Nathaniel, being Nathaniel, said, can anything good come out of Nazareth? And Philip's answer was natural he said come and see and you'll see for yourself now while paul was waiting for them this is from the book of acts now while paul was waiting for them at athens his spirit was provoked with them within him 
as he saw that the city was full of idols. So he reasoned in the synagogue with the Jews and the devout persons and in the marketplace every day with those who happened to be there. Now, we, we skip over what was really happening, but Paul was waiting. He, so he had gone on to Athens and he was waiting for the rest of his missionary entourage to join him. Okay? And as he was waiting, he was walking the streets of one of the most boldly idolatrous cities that ever existed. Everywhere he walked, he would have seen statues and uh, trinkets and temples, all that were dedicated not just to gods, but to gods that were lewd. I mean, bigger than life-size representations. And it stirred him. It stirred his, it vexed his righteous soul. And it stirred him so that he began to move into action. And he went into the synagogues and he began to teach the Jews. Now, he, he was teaching them what it meant to be followers of Jesus. And there were people who were devout that came in as well that understood that the God of the Jews was the one that was the one true God. And so he went and he preached to them, but he didn't stop there. He, he went outside of the church in that, in that very wicked uh, atmosphere and began to preach in the marketplace. And Paul's example in Athens then, with, with all of that context, is, is the challenge to us to be fishers of men. 1 Corinthians 9, Paul says this, For though I am free from all, I have made myself a servant to all, that I might win more of them. To the Jews I became as a Jew in order to win Jews. To those under the law I became as one under, under the law, though not being myself under the law, that I might win those under the law. To those outside the law I became as one outside the law, not being outside the law of God, but under the law of Christ, that I might win those outside the law. To the weak I became weak, that I might win the weak. I have become all things to all people, that by all means I might save some. I do it all for the sake of the gospel, that I may share with them in its blessings. Not only did Paul go and make disciples, he also lived in such a way as to persuade as many as he could to follow Jesus. In conclusion, I want us to look at a summary of what we've learned about discipleship. Being a disciple of Jesus means we must commit. This is that I die daily, dying out, putting God first in such a way that we abandon any plans that we had for our lives, dedicating ourselves to Christ, live committed to Him each day, we must follow him. We must cultivate a relationship with God. How do we do that? We do that by being in the Word, and we're going to talk about that more next week. Um, Jesus is the Word, and obey what he commands. And then third, we imitate. We imitate the example of Christ, and we should follow the example of other godly men and women. Now, imitation is not impersonation. The purpose of somebody impersonating someone else generally is to fool people who are looking on. That's not at all what we're doing. It also doesn't mean that I'm trying to impersonate you or you to impersonate me that you uh, wear the same kind of tie I do or maybe, you know, I'm crazy enough to wear a jacket in this building tonight. Uh, you, that's, that's not at all necessary. But it's simply imitating Jesus and then showing others by our example and letting them imitate us as we as we imitate Jesus so that we become like Jesus here here's the thing um, does anyone here know what Jesus actually looked like when he was on this earth and the answer is no and yet we understand what it means to be like Jesus, because it's something that's inside. It's our character. It's our viewpoint. It's the way we live our life. That's what we need to be imitating, 
not impersonating. Also, imitate the example. Don't try to duplicate the results. The, the temptation is often to do my best to be like Billy Graham because he won many people to Jesus. Or, and we can name great preachers, whoever they may be, that have had a great influence, or, or you know, John Wesley or Jonathan Edwards. And, and there's nothing wrong with looking at those men for an example and learning from them. But we, we are not necessarily going to duplicate their results. And, and that's why I like that story of, of the little lady that kept the toll booth down there south of Lexington, Kentucky, uh, that, that when and H.C. Um, Morrison went down there to pastor and they said, oh, do you know her? Have you met her yet? And, and she was so timid. And yet everybody that knew her knew that she was a Holy Spirit-filled woman of God. Because she was loud? No. But because she was consistent? Yes. And yet that quiet lady who never left that little area of Kentucky, by, by her influence, um, Beverly Carradine was sanctified because of, he heard her story and he went and found her and he talked with her. And she, she died not knowing that she would ever have any kind of an influence. And yet, because of her godly, saintly, quiet life that she lived, she influenced a man who was a great evangelist. And, and there's multiple stories like that that we could bring up. So, imitate the example. Don't try to duplicate the results. Coach, we must show others how to be disciples by teaching them and setting an example for them to follow. That's so important because there's nobody else necessarily that can fill your shoes when it comes to your circle of influence. And then persuade. We must call the lost to repentance and faith in Christ and then nurture them and help them to become disciples. And, and this is a visual example of what I've been talking about. You can look at it in five minutes and understand what I've been talking about for 45 minutes. But what you see here, this, this, this is labeled you, okay? And, and you, have a, you have a vertical relationship to Jesus. He's up here, he, he died on the cross. Committed to Jesus, following Jesus, imitating Jesus. And at the same time, you have this horizontal relationship between you and other believers where you imitate Jesus that they may see it and you coach each other and you encourage that's your that's our community of believers that's our little church encouraging each other to be followers of Jesus why because there's the lost down here and we can persuade the lost by our example of who Jesus is this is how we're ambassadors for Christ. That we can persuade them that the answer to their problems, to their problems in life, for, the answer for life is Jesus Christ. So that is lesson one. And we will return next Sunday evening, Lord willing, to move on to part two, go and make disciples. I follow Jesus.